Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another exciting episode of Paul Brown Show. Yeah. In our society, we have individuals who have been falsely accused of crimes by our law enforcement. Today, I have as my special guest, he's Mr. Whit Darnell Alexander, and he's also a hip hop artist. How you doing there, Mr. Alexander? I'm doing great. Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. My name is Whit Darnell Alexander Jr. Um, I'm from Salisbury, North Carolina, and I go by stage name Brazy Brazy, B-R-A-Z-Y, B-R-A-Z. Okay, um, you were arrested of a crime. Tell the audience a little bit about what happened to you. Correct. Um, June 24th, um, 2018, I was arrested, falsely accused of a double murder, death of Mariah Turner and her unborn child. Um, I was snatched out of my home for my family and I was just judged, I was accused, I was bashed, I was sabotaged, I was slandered by my own community. Um, like I say, um, it was for, I wanna say, uh, uh, I don't wanna be too, I don't wanna be too rude how I said, but it was about a fiend, a crackhead, a person who was on drugs, who pointed me out of a lineup and told me I mean, told the police department, like, it was him. And they just put the charge on me. No investigation, how they were supposed to. They just did what they wanted to do. Correct. And that's another question I was going to ask is, why did they label you out as far as the individual that committed this crime? Um, I want to say seven days before um, the murder had happened, I was at Christo's. It's a chicken spot that they sell soul food in Salisbury, North Carolina. Okay. And um, across the street is Advanced Auto Parts. And across the street, uh, it was a girl, that's my brother's sister actually. She was there with her boyfriend, that is the deceased brother. And um, I knew them, you know what I'm saying? I knew them from growing up as a young childhood. So I had went over to talk to them and we just was chopping it up, getting to know each other because it was like we ain't seen each other forever. So we was talking and the smoker who was there that accused me and pointed me out in the lineup, he was there, um, so that's how he pointed me out. Okay, all right. Being that you were innocent, how did you feel about the, your lawyer that defended you? I mean, because you, you said you were innocent, and how did you feel about being the representation that you were having at that time? I mean, I had a public defender, um, Mr. Doug Allen Smith, and a lot of people say that public defenders don't, they don't do their job or they just not in it for you, they in it for us. I'm here to say that that's not true. Um, my public defender, he worked hard. When I told him my story and where I was at from the beginning to end, the first day we met, he jumped right on it. You know, he taught, He called uh, Mr. Sam Russell, who was my private investigator. He worked for Magnum um, Investigation, private investigations. And um, if it wasn't for him getting my private investigator that fast, I wouldn't have got the videos they got of me in Charlotte, North Carolina at the Epic Center, you know, so he was, he said my case, like, he said in the first couple minutes talking to somebody with one of the serious cases like I got, he said that he know if somebody lying or not, because he's been doing it for so long, but because I knew where I was at from, you know what I'm saying, everywhere I went to, he was just like, you didn't stutter, you wasn't lying, he right. was like, so I knew it was some truth in what you were saying, so they jumped right on it and they went and got the videos and I still went from there. When you was arrested, how did your family take this, you know, being that you were being accused of this crime, how did your family and your friends take this in? That is kind of a, a kind of iffy situation. As far as friends, a lot of people that I thought was my friends, they faded, you know what I mean? Like, I look at it like if you know somebody, then they say like that this person they did, so this happened. If you know somebody, you just be like, nah. Like I know him, or I know her. Um, so some people who just faded, I get, I took it as they didn't really know me like I thought they knew me, and they wasn't really friends. You know what I mean? So, family, my it's been like a rocky situation with my family. Um, both of my parents are deceased. My uh, father died in 2000 from cirrhosis of the liver, and my mom died in 2005 from they found uh, spots on her brain. Um, so I got my grandma, I got my aunts, I got my sisters, my brothers. Um, my sister was there, 
Um, I talked to her on the phone. She kept money on the phone when she could. My aunt, she came along towards um, like the middle. She was there actually there the first day. And then be, because my aunt, she got like a lot going on and she worked a lot, but she was there for my child. So that's the main thing that I was happy about. So she was there from um, day one with my child and stuff and kept him intact. Excuse me. Um, some of my mom's sisters, I mean, they was just, they went their separate way, like they turned their head. So. How did that make you feel? I mean, um, they, 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 being that they've seen you since you were little mm -hmm. and watching you grow up and now you're being accused of some crime, they know that. Yeah. That's not you. That's it, not your character. It, it hurt. You know what I mean? It hurt me in some ways because I looked at it like, okay, if it was just a regular charge, like something like, let's say shoplifting or breaking and entering and I was only facing like a year or something like that, I was going to get out and they was like, you know, I'm tired of him getting in trouble type stuff and they turned their head. That's different. But I'm like, I'm facing murder. I'm facing a death penalty. Like you may right. never speak to me again. So when you turn your head on that situation, that let me knew in my mind, I was like, okay, if they put me to sleep, say if I didn't have the video and they was to give me the lethal injection and put me to sleep, you was content, you was fine with never ever talking to me again. The next time you would have heard about me, they would have been like, you know, they putting them to sleep today, you know what I'm saying? So it hurt to let me know like, you don't you don't care like for me like you say you do. You know what I mean? Like you was just fine with me dying, dying out, you know so. Okay, how did you deal with being in prison or incarcerated with this charge? It was hard. I fought a lot. I dealt with a lot of depression. Um, I had nightmares. I couldn't sleep. But um, I met with a lady named Miss Mouse at the prison they sent me to at the high rise. And she, um, she kind of coped with me a lot. She was kind of like a counselor. So I met with her. She used to give me like word searches, breathing techniques, um, how to go to sleep, not to put too much on my stomach when I go to sleep. Because if you eat, I don't know if a lot of people know, if you eat before you go to sleep, it makes you dream. Okay. So to keep the nightmares away, I just stopped eating at a certain time before I went to sleep. I did a lot of breathing exercises. I read a lot of books. And keep my mind off of like certain stuff, you know what I mean? But um, like I said, I, I did a lot of that. I walked, I exercised, um, I watched TV when I could. I read the paper and I read the Bible a lot and prayed. So that kept my mind clear. Being that you were innocent and being that you were spending all this time incarcerated, was there ever a time where as you were starting to believe that you actually did that? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because you, you're being falsely accused and it's like they're treating you like you did something. Right. Um, there was never a time I actually had believed that I actually did it because I know I Correct. didn't do it. You know what I'm right. saying? So I never had those thoughts. I did have thoughts where I was like, I may never see the day of light again because I know how Roaring County is. Um, I know how they is with the, the justice system, how they don't just, they don't really care about, I feel like, now this is how I feel, I feel like they don't really care about getting the right person off the streets or, or bringing justice to somebody's family. They just care about convicting somebody, okay. you know? So I looked at it as, okay, I, I'm another African-American man. I got I got a record, you know what I'm saying, a little record. I, I got a white collar crime, what they call them. I don't got nothing serious on my record. It's like, they would fit in this category. And they break felonies down in categories where you got like class A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way up. So, a, B, C, and D auto is like the most serious offense. Mine is kind of like down to like I's and J's and stuff like oh, that. Okay. Right. So um, I just looked at it like, okay, I got a little record. I'm another African American male. This is what I'm accused of. They're going to believe what they want to believe. And here's the facts. I presented the fact, I presented the proof. So um, I looked at it like once we gave you the proof and you didn't want to let me go, then. I mean, I never see the light again. If you're not going off the evidence that I got that shows that I'm innocent, it's over for me. I should still be sitting here, so. So how did that, I mean, at what point did you show them the proof? You know, I mean. I was arrested June 24th, 2018. They had the proof by like July 2nd, maybe 4th, 5th, something like that. And they still kept um, you in custody. Right, the, um, the oh. times that they went and got the video, um, my uh, my lawyer had to get certain videos subpoenaed. Some places give you videos, but they to protect your identity. They was like, okay, we understand you as a lawyer, you're a private investigator, but you have to have 
a subpoena. So we had to wait a couple of days, so it pushed the time back. So I want to say like within like 10, 15 days apart than most, they had all the proof to like videos that I was here at this location around this time that this murder happened. So they knew that. So how does that make you feel about our court system knowing that this evidence wasn't given out? In us? It's court systems that some court systems is ran correctly. It just depends on the area and who's, you know what I'm saying, who's elected, who's the DA, who your lawyer is, who the police officers are, because it happens everywhere. So I've just felt that our court system in Ryan County is is destroyed. It's corrupt, you know what I'm saying? It's it's evil. It's not it's not professional to me, you know, so and I think it needs to be investigated. I feel like um that they just do what they want to do. I look at it like Ryan County is its own little town, which it is, but it's like they got their own little world. You play by their rules, and that's it. That's just how it goes. Unless you bring in some heavy hitters in there that's going to really fight for you. If not, you just you get lost in the, you know what I'm saying? You get lost in the system. Describe that feeling when you were informed that they were going to release you. It was it was unreal. I'm I'm not gonna lie. Like I was asleep. Um, it was like twelve something, maybe twelve fifteen, twelve thirty. In the afternoon they woke me up and they came and got me and they was like, um, I'm thinking I was going to the nurse because I had an ear infection there. So I was like, um, where I'm going? And it's this lady named Miss Tillery that was there and she was just like, um, put a smile on your face. And she was like, was you sleep? And I was like, yeah. She was like, put a smile on your face. So I was just like. Um, all right, but well, where am I going? And she said it again. She was like, put a smile on your face, and she walked off. So I was just like, well, whatever that's about. So the next officer, he put me on the elevator. He took me downstairs. Um, I seen my private investigator, Mr. Sam Russell, and my paralegal is Rachel Hughes. And um, they took me in a little conference room, and they shook my hand, and it was like, um, you look tired. They didn't know that I didn't know that I had, um, they thought I already knew the news, but I didn't. Okay. So they were just like, you don't know what's going on type stuff. And I was like, nah, they're like, you happy to see us? So I was like, I mean, I guess you got some good news for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he was like, well, um, the, the uh, your lawyer just, Mr. Dub, my lawyer, was like, he just got the, um, the dismissal and congratulations, you're going home. Your case has just been dismissed. So I was just sitting there like, you, you, you can't be playing with me because this is serious. Like, this is a life or death situation. So I was like, for real? And he was like, yeah. And they shook my hand. Like, I thought I was going to jump up and scream and shout, but it was still like an unreal moment for me. Like, I was like, I'm not dreaming. Like, somebody pinched me. <laughs> you know, I'm, this is not a dream. But I, I was happy, though. I smiled. I couldn't stop smiling. All I could think about was, like, my son. I finally get to go home and hug my son. So. I know you talked about your son. Tell us a little bit about your son. Name and I've been in and out my son life. His name is Jeremiah Anthony Alexander. Um, he was born in 2015, October 20th. Um, and I've been incarcerated like in jail, so I was kind of like in and out of his life. So I never got to spend a birthday with my son. Like every time it came around his birthday, I was locked up. So that's why it's like it's a blessing to be home. His birthday now is what, like Sunday, mm. in a couple of days. So I get to spend a birthday with him. Um, the day I came home, I was still in my prison slides, prison clothes, and I went straight to um, the daycare to get him out of daycare. And when he seen me, he just jumped up and just ran and jumped in my arm. So, so he recognized you, right? That was my. That was the main thing. I was just glad he remembered who I was. You know, my child mom, she brought him up there when she could to oh, visit okay. me, and my aunt would bring him to visit me and stuff. And he'd be beating on the class, you know. So I was like, he still know who I am. So she say, um, she'd be like, who's that? He'd be like, that's my daddy. So I'm just glad I didn't lose, you know what I'm saying, that relationship with him. But now we just a lot of bonding. I took him to a uh, state fair Correct. when I came home. Took him to Chuck E. Cheese. He kept saying, I want to go to Chuck E. Cheese. I want to go to Chuck E. Cheese. So I took him to Chuck E. Cheese. So we do just do a lot of bonding, like stuff that I didn't really get to do when I was out last time. Because he was young. Now he getting older. He's about to be four. Um, Teach him like how to ride his bike, play basketball. You know, he know his ABCs and one, two, three. So I taught him that. So why is it so important that men be in their kids' life? Because um, 
a lot of people don't understand. It's a lot of people who have children and they lay up, have babies with girls and disappear. And it's nobody that's a father figure that's to teach the child like right from wrong or about like depression or feelings and stuff like that. So you got a lot of kids who get bullied in school and stuff like that and they commit suicide. You know, or they feel like don't nobody love them. You know, they, don't, they don't feel comfort. And you go around other people who got kids and like in school, you might have family day or parent day where parents come get to eat with the kid and say you have the father not in the child's life. So the child just looking like everybody else family here. You know what I'm saying? So it, it makes them feel some type of way. So I feel like like you need that you need that 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 love, and only a father and a mother can give that type of love. I mean, some kids get attached to grandmas and aunties and stuff like that, but there's nothing like mom and dad. Correct. So. Okay. There's a Mr. John Barnett. Describe what he's doing in your situation. Mr. John Barnett is a political uh, activist. He um he was actually found by my aunt. She found him for me, my aunt Cynthia Bryant. Um, she said he popped up on TV one day and she gave him a call. And he's about he's about the African American uh, culture. Like a lot of people that's just done wrong by the justice system. And he's one of those heavy hitters that I talk about about going to 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 find justice for us, you know what I'm saying? And for the other people that's out, whether it's car accidents, whether it's uh, stuff like this, like wrongfully accused, um, because the system, uh, a lot of it, it just, they just lock you up, you know what I'm saying? Uh, just throw you away, try to get rid of you. So he about fighting for you, you know what I mean? Um, he's helping me now uh, fight back towards the DA in my county, uh, Brandy Cook. Mm -hmm. um, the, the sheriff department, Orange County Sheriff Department, um, because they need to be investigated. So he's helping me with that. He's helping me cope. He's helping me get back to how I used to be. You know what I'm saying? Succeed in society, you know, and be feel normal. Because it's times where I, I still don't feel normal around officers or around, you know what I'm saying? Just in my county alone. And I was born and raised there. So I feel like my son still lives there. So when I go there to get him, I just, I don't, I feel weird when I'm there. I feel like, people may still be out to get me because people gonna believe what they want to believe you know because they put on the news and say that he innocent or his case was dismissed to so some people it don't matter that's what they said did it that's what they contend with so when I got somebody like Mr. John Barnett um to show me like it don't matter what they say we're gonna fight to the end we're gonna show them that Mr. Whit Dr. Alexander Jr. is not that man they say he is he's a different person you know he's a father he's a musician you know, so, and, and that's what he do, that's what he work on. Mr. Alexander, you're an aspiring hip-hop artist. How long have you been in that field, the music industry? Um, I've been writing music for a while, I want to say over 10 years. My dad played drums for a band called the Crown Heights Affair out of Brooklyn, New York. Um, so I used to go to his shows and stuff when I was young, so I was always around music. But uh, I was born in the 90s, in 92 to be exact. So it's the hip hop era, and I started off writing poetry when I was in Baltimore, Maryland. So um, I just turned my poetry to like rhymes. Um, so I started off with cassette tapes, recording over cassette tapes, and um, I, I went from there. You know, I started putting out little mixtapes, doing a little open mics, just getting heard, trying to see if people like my style, trying something new, or if they like the message that I was giving out. Sometimes I got positive feedback. Sometimes it was kind of like, uh, uh. but as the, over the years, like I perfected my craft and it just got better and better. So I grew a fan base. I started websites. I had an app. So, um, like I said, I, I rap about like a lot of my stuff. Like I call it raw, and it's, it's it's real. It's what certain people can relate to. It coming from where I came from, like a struggle. You know what I mean? Like I've been homeless before. I can relate to a lot of people. Like I've been homeless. I've been fired from jobs, kicked out of school. I've been turned against on, like from family and friends. Um, I've been incarcerated, so I can relate to a lot of people. So I just rap about what I feel, you know what I'm saying? What advice would you give young artists who's trying to get into that industry? Stay consistent. Um, it's all about consistency. When you want to do music, you need to have consistent track. Whether you think it's good or not, just stay putting out something, make them tired of your name. Like, let me see what he got now. All 
I keep hearing song, 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 song. Because I, I feel like if you don't like this one, I got playlists and stuff. How about this one? How about this one? How about this one? So I just say consistency. Stay consistent and never let nobody shoot down your dreams. You know, dream big. A lot of artists feel like this is an easy thing to do. No. Is it really that easy? Because you no. see a lot of people trying to get into that. Uh, it's, it's, I say it got a little easier um, now for certain people because with the social media now, and it's so easy to pop on social media, um, going viral and stuff like that, it's a little better, but it's not easy. It's not how people think it is because a lot of people sound the same, so it's not. When you were performing in front of that, that big crowd, describe that feeling that you get. I feel like they're here for me. You know, they want to hear what I got to say. So that's just the feeling I always get. I usually just go playing. I just it's like I'm having one-on-one -on -one conversation with everybody just watching me. So who would you compare your your style to? I know we have some some people in the past. Mm, you know, who would you? It's kind of hard to compare, but if I had to like. How I deliver my message, I like to try to deliver my message in a Tupac kind of way, but I kind of give it a, a down south, like, raw type form, you know what I mean? Like, so, kind of, I guess, Tupac. That's a big name right there, Tupac. Yeah. Yes, sir. Because when he speak, he used to make you feel it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, he was talking about, he make you listen, like, tune in, you mean the TV like this. And him, Tupac, he told us, like, stories. You know, um, about life, everyday life, things that goes on in life, and mm -hmm. you know, and people, a lot of people can relate to that. And that's what I like stories to somebody you can relate to. That's what I like to write about. Tell us about your your album or your song, Innocent. Um, I got a CD coming out next month. Uh, I don't really actually have an actual day yet, okay. but if you follow my blogs, I got um, some days that I'm thinking about dropping it on. I was dropping a mixtape called Innocent, and it's basically about like my life, my case, from what I went through from June 24th to September 11th. And that's June 24th, 2018 to September 11th, 2019, the day I was released. I was incarcerated 444 days to be exact. So I got a song that I'm writing called 444 that um, I think a lot of people are like. How does that make you feel, you know, with that fan base that you have? I feel blessed for real. I feel like it gave me an extra little boost to people. Like, I want to hear what you got to say. You know, I got people emailing me and DMing me. Like, when it's coming out, I'm waiting on it. I, I put little snippets and teases out to let them hear, like, this is what it's going to sound like. So, it's big. It's going to be big. Hmm. Describe that feeling when you be going to larger cities. Um, some of the larger cities, like when I went to Raleigh, that's the state. Um, they showed a lot of love. Like I was, I was actually in there with another dude who was just wrongfully accused, and he just came home. And I keep Mr. John Barnett cards on me, so I'm in there passing cards out and mixtape cards. I like it. Yeah, we finna do something big. And I was like, you need to get in touch with him. Okay. This and so it was just like he was like, yo, you just came home too. And I told him he was wrongfully accused, but he sat in there for probably like. 40 days, 60 days. Okay. When I told him my story, he was like, nah, yours big. I'm like, ain't no story no bigger than the other. Like, we was wrongfully accused and in the same boat. So they showed a lot of love. And I don't think it was just behind that, but just because like people coming home, like the law not getting away with a lot of stuff they got away with. Mr. Alexander, where do you see yourself at five years from now? Five years from now, I see myself somewhere successful. Um, a nice job, a nice um, buzz going on with my music. Um, I see myself grow more with my son um, in a nice house. And, you know, and speaking to other kids, like group home, detention centers, um, jails, prisons, hospitals, like wherever, that psychiatric wards, just wherever kids or people go to, they feel like they're going through something. And not just kids, but older people. You know, somebody who feel like they don't nobody hear them. Because sometimes that's all you need is just somebody that can express what they feel or how you feel. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I know what you're going through, but you don't. Like, you never been homeless before. You never laid in, in, a, in a cot or a hard steel piece of bed. You never ate milk, drunk milk and juice out of a plastic bag. So 
you can't relate to. You say you know how I feel, but you really can't. So when you find somebody that actually comes from that, um, it's like it, it, it helps them more. Like, you, know, you just took a lot of stress off me. Like, you showed me how I can deal with this and gave me steps on how I can make myself, you know what I'm saying, a better person in life. How does it feel knowing that you're probably like a role model for those that have been incarcerated, falsely accused, and coming back out into society. I feel like um, I can make a change. I feel like I can keep what Nipsey Hussle had going on, keep it, because it need more people like him. I feel like I can expand and, and help change the world because I'm not going to change the world overnight. I'm not going to change overnight, but it starts with somebody, you know what I mean? So I feel like maybe I can help keep the crime rate down in my city. I feel like I can help keep from kids committing suicide or, you know, committing a crime doing something when they feel like I don't care. I can get them out of that I don't care mode. Like, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be um, another Bill Gates or I'm gonna be the next, you know what I'm saying? Like somebody big, I wanna be the next Oprah Winfrey. Like you can dream like that. Why do you feel Rowan County needs to be investigated? Because they unprofessional and I feel like that they're gonna do what they wanna do until somebody steps in and say like, this is not right, you know? I feel like they do a lot of stuff behind closed doors that a lot of people don't know what's going on unless you incarcerated down there, unless you go through their they justice system or their courthouse. And um, I just feel like maybe somebody need to just come look into what they got going on because it's, it's not right. It's a lot of people that's in there now that's just been sitting and they handing out life sentences to people like it's brochures, you know, like, and they don't have n nothing on nobody, like no evidence. They just take what they get and send you up the road. Mr. Alexander, we're running short on time. If the viewing audience want to get in contact with you, how would they go about doing that? You go to Google, you can go to any social media and type in Whit Donna Alexander Jr. or you can go type in Brazy Braze to follow any of my music, B-R-A-Z-Y, B-R-A-Z. Don't space it. Um, and just check out my blogs. Um, I got emails on there, you can email me. I got phone numbers where you can contact me and um, just listen to my message, my story. Mr. Alexander, I really appreciate you coming on the show and telling the audience about what happened to you being falsely accused because this is something that goes on in our society on a regular basis. Right. And because of that new cameras and we're able to videotape these type of activities, a lot of people that are incarcerated because especially in the past, yeah. they, we didn't have those cameras to film these stuff and so they were basically yeah. just found guilty. Yeah. You were guilty until proven innocent. But I really appreciate you for coming on the show. Anytime you want to come back, I look forward to coming back. I definitely will. Thank you. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for watching the show and you be encouraged. Can't stop though.